Welcome to a new quarter of study for us. We're in Matthew's Gospel, but with a special focus in Matthew's Gospel. I used to teach a course at Southern Wesleyan called uh, Life and Teachings of Jesus. I was not the first one to teach that course, and others have taught it since. That's one of the, the uh, uh, hallmark courses, I think, of the university across the years. But I loved it. I, I love teaching it, and uh, I think it's one of the most effective courses in the curriculum. Uh, I, I was talking to Ken Dill about it, Ken the retired chaplain at the college. He said when he was in school they didn't call it life and teachings. That's what the teacher called it. The students called it tales and trails. <laughs> tales and trails of Jesus Christ. Well, this quarter we're going to be tackling the teaching part of life and teachings. Uh, that would be the uh, tales part and not the trails for those of Ken's generation. And except for a Christmas lesson, which we'll have in just a few weeks, and you know that if you've looked ahead in your quarterly, uh, we're going to be focusing not on the events in Jesus' life as recorded by Matthew, but on the teaching that Christ provided that Matthew has passed on to us. Uh, this is our first Sunday in this study, and uh, for the last couple of weeks we've been handing out the quarterlies for this quarter. If you didn't get one yet, see me afterward we have plenty be glad to uh, provide you with that you can uh, stay up on your reading week by week prior to our meeting together in Sunday school uh, first a word about Matthew's gospel itself Matthew was a disciple of Jesus Christ you know that but he, he was more than that Jesus had many disciples then and now you and I are disciples of Jesus Christ if we are followers of Christ. Modern disciples as well as disciples in the biblical period and all the years in between. But the word disciple literally means a student, literally means a learner. Jewish rabbis were teachers, their students were their disciples. We see in the New Testament that uh, some of the disciples of John the Baptist left and began to follow Jesus when John pointed to him as the Messiah. That's not a competition between John and Jesus. All the rabbis had disciples and John was steering his to the master teacher to Christ. Uh, the teachers of Jesus' day didn't teach in a classroom. They taught anywhere there was a lesson to be learned by their students. And so the, the rabbis would be uh, itinerant teachers moving from place to place. The students came with them and learned from them as they traveled. The ebb and flow of everyday life. There were many rabbis to choose from. Jesus' followers chose him wisely. He was, of course, more than a teacher. You know that. But he was a teacher and a rabbi uh, is one of the terms that's used to describe him in Scripture. As was customary for the rabbis, Jesus taught as he traveled. He taught from the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He taught in the synagogue. He taught in the courts of the temple. He taught at Jewish festivals. He taught around the table at mealtime, and he taught on the mountainside, which is our study for this quarter, and where we begin, at least, our study in Matthew's record of Jesus' teaching. Most of Jesus' disciples are not named in the scripture. Twelve of them are. We often call them the twelve disciples, as if Jesus only had twelve. He had many, many more than that. But these 12 were in a special relationship with him. Luke tells us about it. Luke says one day Jesus called all of his disciples to him and from them he chose 12. 12 who would be even closer to him. 12 who would virtually live with Jesus for the three years of his ministry. That meant leaving their homes. That meant leaving their jobs. Uh, remember the fishermen who walked away from their boats to follow Jesus and to live by faith because they were walking away from their income. 
uh, to spend time with Jesus 24-7. And so when disciples are referred to in Scripture, it may mean the 12, but it, it may also mean that larger group that included all of those who would follow Jesus whenever they could get away or whenever he was close enough to them that they could come and listen to his teachings. Matthew had the privilege of being one of the 12. Matthew, you'll remember, was a tax collector, a hated tax collector, representing the Romans in a Jewish uh, culture that didn't appreciate Roman oppression. And yet, Jesus called him to come and follow Matthew became not only a follower of Jesus, but a recorder of the words and teachings of Jesus as we have it in his gospel because Matthew was literate. Not all people were in those days. In fact, many were not. Uh, but Matthew used that gift to pass on to us the teachings of Jesus. It's no great surprise that as we look this quarter at what Matthew recorded about the teachings of Jesus, we start with the Sermon on the Mount. It's no surprise because that's where the teaching of Jesus starts in the Gospel of Matthew. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 are the Sermon on the Mount in, in some detail. Uh, but the first four chapters lead up to that moment. Chapter 1 is about the birth of John the Baptist. Chapter 2 is about Jesus' birth, that very familiar chapter to us at Christmas time. In chapter 3, we see Jesus' baptism by John. In chapter 4, we see Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. All of this, and the calling of, of the first disciples in chapter 4, all of this is preliminary to the beginning of his ministry. And so when we get to chapter 5, Jesus sits down and teaches them saying and the ministry of Jesus is laid open to his disciples and through them to us beginning in chapter 5 of Matthew's gospel we call it the Sermon on the Mount but Matthew actually treats it like a lesson Matthew says he taught them I think a good sermon has good teaching in it I hope good teaching has a sermon in it they're, they're first cousins, these two forms of communication, uh, when it comes to the Christian message. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, is teaching his disciples the greatest lesson ever taught. And the greatest lesson ever taught began with the Beatitudes, our study for today. Here's the setting. Verse 1 of chapter 5. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and sat down. Seated was the posture of a teacher typically in Jesus' day. We're more used to students sitting while the teacher stands. It was reversed in those days. The teacher sat and Jesus sat on a mountainside. Mountain doesn't necessarily mean a great mountain here. We're not talking Mount Mitchell probably. What we're looking at is, is one probably of the many large hills in Israel that, that are labeled as mountains. Some of them are honest to goodness mountains and others may be a little under what we especially here in the Blue Ridge and the Great Smokies would call a mountain. But this was a place that was easily accessible to a large number of people. And they gathered around Jesus as he taught. Possibly, Jesus chose this setting, the slope of what they considered to be a mountain, because he was about to become, to them, the new Moses, in the sense that he had a new law to pass on to God's people. Moses went up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, and brought down the law of the Old Testament. Jesus, seated on a mountainside, brings a new law, a higher law to his people. Later in the sermon, he will draw a contrast between the law of the Old Testament and the new law that he comes to bring. He'll say things like, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. You've heard it said, don't kill. That's out of the Old Testament law. But I say, don't even hate. Jesus' higher law. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say unto you, don't even lust. 
Jesus' higher law. You see, he's raising the standard, not lowering it, raising the standard that they had been under from Old Testament times, and he is internalizing the law beyond actions to attitudes in the hearts and lives of the believers. Moses was revered by the people as the lawgiver from God. Jesus now seated on a mountain says, I have a higher law for you to follow. In this setting, his disciples came to him, Matthew says, and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the Beatitudes begin. Beatitude is a word out of Latin for the, for the word makarios in Greek that's used here in Matthew's gospel. It means blessed. The Bible was in Latin for centuries before the Reformation made it available to people in their own language, which we enjoy and take for granted so much today. Uh, but for, for centuries, uh, only those who understood Latin could actually read the Bible, and that was generally, uh, for all intents and purposes, that meant the priest and the scholars were the ones who had direct access to God's Word, and everybody else had to depend on their interpretation of it. Now, we have a great gift since then of being able to read and study God's Word for ourselves. But that's why I hear a Latin word is so um, prevalent today. We talk about the Beatitudes because the word for blessed in Latin comes from that root word. Blessed speaks of divine approval. Blessed speaks of divine favor. Uh, some of the more, uh, freer translations use the word happy to describe it. Uh, makarios is a very positive word, but happy doesn't seem to be the best rendering of it. Happiness is an emotion. Emotions come and emotions go. It, it's interesting to me that the more standard translations, like the NIV, for instance, Stay with that word blessed because it signals God's role in this. It's divine approval. It's divine favor. It is divine love expressed to those who are the family of God and living according to his ways. We all want to hear well done when this life is passed. I know we do, every one of us. That's our goal. When we transition from this world to the next, we want the Lord to say, well done. In a sense, he's given us a list of ways right here in which he is already saying well done to us. Not at the end of our lives, but as we live it. If we're following these words, of guidance that Jesus shared. If we look at blessed that way, as God's well done here and now, I think it can open up this text to us as in the one we're looking at now. Well done are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If that's the case, if we can experience that divine well done to a degree even in this life by living by this blueprint that we have in the Beatitudes and in the fuller Sermon on the Mount, then it, it becomes something of a measuring rod for us. Uh, how, how do we qualify for God's well done? What, what's God's standard for sharing that approbation with us, that word of approval with us. Later in the chapter, Jesus actually says this is the case. Later in the chapter, in verse 20, Jesus says, I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you certainly will not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
You see the measurement there? Here's where you are in the standard. Here's where God expects us to be in the standard. The Pharisees haven't lived up to it, will you? That's the idea that he's placing here. I, the, the picture I get, I'm sorry, I can't help it. It's that sign at Disney World that says you have to be this tall to ride this attraction. You know? And when you're a little kid, you stand on tiptoe and you stretch and you really try to be. That, that God is saying, I've got a level of commitment, of faith, of obedience for you. To enjoy the full blessing of a well done from the Father. The good news is he'll help us get there. We're not on our own. He's not just the measuring rod. He's the one who helps us live up to it and rise to that standard. In, in saying that, Jesus is saying the current standard is wrong. The current standard you're being taught, the current standard you're living by is not what the Old Testament intended it is supposed to be an open door into the attitudes of the heart and that's what I've come to reinforce for you. And the Pharisees and the scribes are not living up to that. Now, if you and I were in the audience that day, let's say in the classroom that day, there would be from us a gasp of surprise. Jesus just picked out the two groups that were the religious leaders of the people and he said, they don't measure up. This is, this is like the religious police. Especially the Pharisees were so strict in enforcing the law, they put everybody into fear. And, and Jesus is saying, they haven't even measured up. They're not where God expects them to be. If your righteousness doesn't exceed theirs, you won't make it. In other words, they're not going to make it. Unless they change. Now, if this is the first lesson from a, from a new teacher, can you imagine the buzz on Facebook after this? <laughs> Jesus, is, Jesus is breaking norms right off the bat so that th there's no question that the message he's preaching is not just same old, same old. This is something new and, and advanced that God has in store for his people that... When they look back in the Old Testament, they can say, well, I see signs of it now I didn't ever see before. But now I understand because he's laid it out so clearly for us. Okay, so back to the text. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You enjoy God's approval. Divine favor rests on you. Who are the poor in spirit? Most scholars agree this is a word about humility. This is a word about people who know they need God and don't trust their own goodness because it's just not enough. I won't stay here. We looked at the subject of humility just a couple weeks ago when we were talking about Nebuchadnezzar's pride. Remember, as we studied the exilic prophets, Nebuchadnezzar said, this great Babylon which I made and it's my city and look what I have done. God called him into account for that. It's the opposite of what Jesus is talking about here. There was nothing poor in spirit about Nebuchadnezzar. I'm afraid there's nothing poor in spirit often about us. And we need to remember that everything we have and all we're able to do is only because of God and his work in our lives. We said then uh, humility is often misunderstood as a low opinion of ourselves. Low self-esteem is not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about self-forgetfulness. He's talking about our eyes not being on us, but on him and on others. Jesus knew humility. Jesus modeled humility. John reminds us of that in Philippians 2. Jesus left heaven and humbled himself. And now he's saying, I invite you to do that as well with God's help. God blesses those who see life that way. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Divine favor in our grief, divine favor in our mourning, yes, and on more than one level. We know that when we grieve a loss, the comfort that God has for us is a blessing. 
We've all been there. We know what that is like. But I think he goes deeper than that here. I think he's also talking about not just mourning some physical loss, but but he's when when we mourn our spiritual condition, when we mourn our spiritual shortcomings, when when we grieve because we aren't as close to the Lord as we would like to be, or because we haven't been as faithful as we need to be in our life, God approves. That's the spirit he can work with. We're all works in progress. We just have to acknowledge that. Humility says, I've made it. Uh, 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 Pride says, I've made it. Humility says, by God's grace, I will. I will be faithful today to the level that I can trust his grace and his love. And without it, there's nothing I can do that is worth anything in the eyes of God. That's a spirit God can work with. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. This might be the most misunderstood of all the Beatitudes. Because the world typically takes meekness to mean weakness. There are two people in the Bible who are called meek. Moses and Jesus. I rest my case. There's no weakness there. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. It's not a bull in a china shop kind of strength. It's not a destructive kind of strength. It's strength channeled. Strength under control. Strength that serves a purpose. Strength with divine direction behind it. Verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. No surprise to see righteousness in this list, is it? We could expect that Christ would mention that standard of holiness that God calls us to in the scripture. But look at the verbs. Do we hunger and thirst for it? Is it a passion for us? Is it something that we cannot be satisfied without? Think how essential food and drink is for survival. Christ said, that's how righteousness should rank in your life and mine. That's how Christ's likeness should rank in your life and mine. I can't survive without it. I've got to have it. I want to be more like him all the time. That's a spirit God can work with. And that's a spirit that can sense divine approval. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful. They will be shown mercy. Later in this same sermon, this amazing sermon, Jesus shares the Lord's Prayer. Not just the Beatitudes, but it's got the Lord's Prayer, and it's got the Golden Rule, and it's got so much else that's part of our uh, uh, Hall of Fame of Scripture passages uh, in the New Testament come out of this single sermon and in the Lord's Prayer. What, what are we led to pray? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. If we need mercy, we need to show mercy. John Wesley was a missionary in Georgia uh, early in his career. And uh, James Oglethorpe, who was the uh, key figure in the planting of the colony of Georgia, made John Wesley his number one assistant. Uh, Wesley heard him say one time something that called for a word of caution from his chaplain, John Wesley. And uh, Wesley said, that's, that's a matter where you need to exercise some forgiveness. Oglethorpe said, sir, I never forgive. Wesley said, sir, I hope you never offend. If we expect forgiveness in our offenses, we have to be prepared to give it for others. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. It couldn't be said any plainer. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. C.S. Lewis said, nobody else will want to. Think about that. Think about that. If you're not pure in heart, do you want to stand before holy God? That's a reward for the pure in heart. That's punishment for those who aren't. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Think of the conflicts around Jesus' world when he spoke these words. The Jews hated the Romans. The Romans hated the Jews. Common folk resented scribes and Pharisees. Scribes and Pharisees looked down on the common folk. Jews hated Samaritans. Samaritans hated Jews. Hey, Jews from the south in Judea despised Jews from the north in Galilee. They thought they were hicks and country folk. Chief priest and Israel's religious establishment hated Jesus. Democrats hated Republicans. Republic no, wait, I'm sorry. I got into... I mixed up my time frames just a little bit there. Here's the thing. Peacemaking doesn't mean we sacrifice our principles to gain peace. It doesn't mean we endorse and accept sin just for the sake of peace. What it means is our goal as we hold on to our principles, our goal as we maintain the standards that God has revealed is to do it in a spirit of shalom. That's the Hebrew word for peace. Shalom is the way they greeted each other. And shalom was their word for goodbye. When a conversation began and when a conversation ended, it was bracketed by peace. That was the idea. Jesus said, let, that, let those brackets surround our lives. Let it, let it surround our attitudes. So far as it depends on us, we are not in the enemy-making business. We stand for what's right. But we want to do it in a spirit of peace. If somebody else makes war, they make war. And I'm not saying war is never essential. I know, I know I really believe God used America to save the world in World War II. I really believe that. I don't believe we were out of his grace or out of his favor, but scripture is still plain. War is the work of the enemy. And if it's sometimes an, an unfortunate necessity, it shouldn't be our go-to response. It actually worries me sometimes how quickly even God's people are to say, well, this means war. We don't have to be pacifists to say, is there another way? And as God leads, I'm going to look for it. Uh, you and I don't make the decisions about countries going to war, but we make the decisions about people going to war and about things that are shared and things that are said and relationships that are broken. Did they really have to be, Jesus is asking? Or is shalom our goal? Uh, quick story. John Fletcher was a friend of John Wesley. John Fletcher, as a, a Wesleyan minister who was also a Church of uh, England rector, had a very effective ministry in the pastorate, but also in his writing. But there was one man who didn't like John Fletcher, who criticized him every chance that he got, who tried to block him in every move that he made, and he made no bones about the fact that he had no use for John Fletcher and never would. The man's family fell apart. His wife left him. He came down with a terrible disease. He had made so many enemies in his life that nobody cared what happened to him, and he was all alone. And John Fletcher moved, in, moved him into his own house 
John Fletcher became his caregiver. John Fletcher was there to meet his needs, and John Fletcher buried him when he died. And the man said to him, why are you doing this when I have hated you so strongly? John Wesley said, it's what Jesus would do. That's what all of this boils down to, isn't it? It, 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 this, these attitudes in the Beatitudes are Jesus' attitudes. Without Him, we can't do them. But with Him, we can. The final Beatitude in verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, if we needed evidence that makarios doesn't really mean happy, here it is. Only a masochist could be happy to be persecuted. But blessed, approved by God, feeling divine favor? Absolutely. And the list is long of those who are faithful in those trials. What a way to begin his teaching ministry. It's not an exhaustive lesson. You can't teach everything at once. But look at the principles he laid down and look at the spirit behind the principles. The Beatitudes are not random virtues. Uh, Eight things out of a hundred that Jesus just chose and said here are things to measure your spiritual growth by. I don't think they're that random at all. I think what they are, perhaps, is the the DNA of the Christian heart. It's not a list of things, now I've done one through three, now I have to tackle four. But rather, if my heart is right, these things are going to be the outgrowth of that. This is going to be the development of my spiritual life. This is what's going to, by God's grace be true for me in my relationships with others. The DNA of God's people because God's people are citizens of God's kingdom. And here's where I want to go before we close today. The Sermon on the Mount has been called the Constitution of the Kingdom of God. I wonder if you noticed how the way that last beatitude ended. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the Kingdom of Heaven. Now let's go back to the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They're like bookends. It's uh, they're a pair of brackets that enclose all of the teaching of Jesus. (coughs) Pardon me. I don't think that's accidental. I think what he's saying here is a kingdom lesson up front. And then we finish this, he says, did you get the kingdom lesson? This is for kingdom people. This is what kingdom people are. This is, this is in the DNA of kingdom people. I say that because this doesn't just seem to be the theme of the Beatitudes. It's the theme of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's not just the theme of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the theme of all the teaching of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel has been called the Gospel of the Kingdom. Matthew refers to the Kingdom of God 54 times in his Gospel. Matthew 2, the story of the wise men, they say, where is he who is born King of the Jews? Chapter 3, John the Baptist comes preaching the Kingdom of Heaven. Chapter 4, Jesus goes through Galilee preaching the good news of the kingdom. Lord's Prayer in the Sermon on the Mount prays, Your kingdom come, your will be done. And a chapter later, we are urged to seek first what? His kingdom and his righteousness. That's the tenor of the whole book. The Sermon on the Mount is like the constitution of the kingdom of God because it concerns the very nature of this kingdom that God is introducing. It's the rule of God in the hearts of his people. This is an unusual kingdom because it's not geographical. 
You won't find it on a map. And it's not America. And it's not Israel. It's not anywhere on the globe. And yet it's everywhere on the globe because it's a kingdom in our hearts and the hearts of all of those who have surrendered to God. If the Sermon on the Mount's the constitution of the kingdom, then the Beatitudes are the preamble to the constitution. In the American constitution, the preamble captures the guiding principles of the document. We, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. You know, you're familiar with the preamble to our Constitution. That's what the Beatitudes do for the Constitution of the Kingdom of God. And I think it's interesting that in the preamble to our Constitution, the word blessings appears. <laughs> Same word that's in the preamble to the Constitution of the Kingdom of God. Not that our nation is the kingdom, but our nation needs to belong to it and our people as well. Funny thing about this kingdom in closing, it's an upside down kingdom. Look at all the things Jesus said and how they contrast with what the world practices. The world says, the battle goes to the strong, and Jesus says, no, it goes to the meek and the humble. They're strong, but not in the same way. Uh, the world says, blessed are those who have, and Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Everything seems to be on, on its head for Jesus, because he's calling us to a different paradigm. He's calling us to a different pattern, a pattern the world had never seen before pattern the world needs desperately. I may have told you the story before. Forgive me. But I heard about a man who broke into a hardware store and didn't steal anything. He just changed all the price tags. So when the store opened for business the next morning, a riding lawnmower sold for $1.99. And a hammer sold for $8,000. Can you imagine the confusion? The confusion because the values had been turned on their head. Jesus is saying God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom. What the world values, God has little use for. What God values, the world has little use for. Either God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom or God's kingdom is the right side up kingdom and the world is upside down. I think I know which way Jesus votes. Let's pray together. Lord, we are humbled. As we read these words, as we sense God's standard and we think, how can I possibly manage that? We thank you for the good news that we don't have to manage that. That the Holy Spirit wants to do that work in our lives. That the Holy Spirit wants to bring us from where we are to where God wants us to be. May we embrace the DNA of the kingdom of God in our hearts. And may we commit ourselves to its practice in Jesus' name. Amen.